Hello, my name is Isabel Baraf. I'm going to talk about uh, stellar properties, uh, <clears throat> in particular determination of stellar properties from the modeler's point of view. So obviously I'm a modeler. So what I want to talk about uh, here is, first of all, I would like to give a very brief presentation about stellar models and put above all stellar models in the context of this second workshop about exoplanet um, and circumstellar disks. So I will very briefly describe the basic ingredients for uh, standard stellar models. And then I've decided to identify three major problems, or at least what I consider uh, major problems and uncertainty of models, specifically in the context of uh, this workshop. And uh, I will go through those three points during my presentation. So first of all, yeah, I would like to give some definitions. I think it's important maybe to know what we are talking about. So definition of stars, stars are characterized by nuclear burning and different phases of nuclear burning. And they form uh, through the gravitational collapse of a molecular cloud. Brown dwarfs most likely form like stars, but they are characterized by the fact that they cannot sustain stable hydrogen burning, and therefore they will contract forever, and their maximum mass is about 0.07 solar mass star. This is theoretically determined. And finally, planets, uh, I mean giant planets, those are objects typically between 10 Earth masses and a few Jupiter masses, and their formation is characterized by formation of protoplanetary disk. And here, I, would, I know there is the IO definition, which actually defines planets as objects, uh, which mass is below the deuterium burning minimum mass, which is 12 Jupiter mass. From my point of view, I think this is quite arbitrary definition, and I much prefer distinguishing brown dwarfs and planets from their formation process. Okay, so first of all, I mean, maybe an important question here, why do we need stellar models? Maybe it's obvious to some of you, maybe it's not obvious at all. So yeah, we do need models to interpret observations and also to determine fundamental properties such as the mass, the radius, age, distance, and chemical composition, what we call also metallicity. So for example, if you have an observed spectrum, then you will need synthetic spectra in order to infer an effective temperature for your object and also a surface gravity. And also same, if you have color magnitude, for example, for a cluster, then if you have good models, then you can infer an age for this cluster, or you can infer as well a metallicity. And also you can infer the mass of an object if it lies on an isochrome. There is also, of course, mass radius relationship, and this is particularly important here in the context of exoplanets, because if you have the radius of the star which hosts a planet, and if you observe a transiting exoplanet, then you can infer the radius of your planet. So if you have good models, uh, you can get the radius of the star and therefore the radius of the planet. So now, what are the basic ingredients for stellar models? So as I said, I just want to go through rapidly. I'm not going to give a kind of lecture on stellar models and stellar evolution. I think they are very good books, textbooks, and reviews for that. But I at least want you to give uh, or, or to give you an idea of, of what we need to build stellar models, the one that you will be using for your observations, for example. So first of all, we need what we call an equation of state, and uh, we need nuclear reactions for stars. We need uh, to describe a heat transport, and usually in stars, this is convection or through radiation, that is the interaction of photons and the matter, characterized by what we call opacities. And we did atmospheres because atmosphere models provide the outer boundary conditions for the interior model. And they also provide synthetic spectra and magnitudes to compare directly to observations. 
So regarding interior structure models, uh, the equation of state which describe the thermodynamic properties of the main components, such as hydrogen, helium, and metals, uh, this equation of state is absolutely crucial because it determines the mechanical structure of an astrophysical body, that is the mass radius relationship. And there has been significant progress, I would say huge progress regarding the, uh, the equation of state for particularly brown dwarfs and giant planets, because this one is quite, I would say, complex and uh, departs strongly from an ideal gas. So you need there to have uh, theoretical efforts as well as experimental efforts to determine this equation of state. Regarding the heat transport, convection is described by what we call the mixing length theory. So this, <clears throat> you can find the description of this, I would say phenomenological model for convection in good textbook. And what I would say is that this uh, mixing length theory provide a good description of the global heat flux in, in an object uh, if in a convective object, as long as there is no rotation and no magnetic field. And I will mention that later in my talk. Finally, radiation. <clears throat> so in stars <clears throat> or in brown dwarfs, you can use the diffusion approximation, which is valid as long as the mean free path for the photon is much, much smaller than the radius of the object. And therefore, you can characterize a radiative flux, which, is, uh, which needs a radiative conductivity, and here, the opacity, which is uh, characterized the interaction of photons with matter is important. And for stellar interiors, we can use actually a mean, an average as a function of the wavelength. For example, the Roseland mean. Now, atmosphere models. <clears throat> we need atmosphere models, as I told you. And particularly, there is a region here, <clears throat> which is important, the photosphere. This is a very tiny region in mass and radius at the surface of the objects. Where the photons can escape, it is therefore an optically thin region where the diffusion approximation is not valid anymore. And therefore, the modeling of atmospheres needs to be decoupled from the inner structure modeling because for atmosphere models, we need to solve the radiative transfer equation. And uh, the equation of state is also different because usually a perfect gas is valid for atmospheres, but we need their uh, opacities that are wavelength dependent. So atmosphere models are crucial because as I mentioned, they provide the outer boundary condition for the interior structure, and also they provide synthetic spectra and photometry. So now evolutionary models actually combine structure models and atmosphere models, structure models that is for a given mass and radius, you get the profile in temperature, density, pressure, <clears throat> and the atmosphere models will characterize the rate at which your object will radiate its internal energy. And the evolution of an object is characterized by nuclear energy, if it's a star, and by the release of gravitational energy and by the release of internal energy at a rate L, the luminosity, which is actually characterized by the atmosphere model. And then your evolutionary model, models are important because they provide the luminosity as a function of time, the radius as a function of time, and many, many properties as a function of time, which is usually what people are looking for. So there has been huge progress within the past decades regarding the equation of state for hydrogen and helium, regarding the calculations of molecular opacities from ab initio calculation, that is from theoretical, I would say, physics calculation, for the main absorbers such as hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, water, methane, etc. And there has been also a lot of progress regarding the treatment of convective transport in atmospheres based on the um, radiative hydrodynamics models. So now we have more reliable models and they uh, are, we can be proud because they are uh, quite a number of successful comparison with observations. And just here to show you, this is a color magnitude diagram where uh, you have objects 
from the solar neighborhood. So typically those are objects quite old. And for example, in black, those are models that were developed in 1998. And in red, those are now models which are including all those improvements in the physics. And as you can see, there is a good match with observations. But well, they are success, but they are also some failure and there are still remaining uncertainties. So now the rest of my talk is about going beyond standard models. So the first um, problem, well, if it's really a problem, I would say the first uncertainty I would like to talk about, this is the evolution at very young ages, and in particular, the problem of initial conditions for stellar models. So when I'm in young ages, so this is typically four ages below 10 million years, where stellar models are particularly needed for age determination. And of course, this is very important for the study of protoplanetary disks and for the study of planet formation, because this can set the time scale for the planet formation process. So ideally, of course, uh, we would like uh, the early evolution of stellar models to account for the star formation process, for the formation of a disk, and of course, for the process of accretion from a disk onto the uh, forming protostar, ideally. But this is very complicated, as you can imagine. So what is t equals zero for stellar models? And I think this is a difficult question. Here you see the evolution. OK, you have stellar model for one solar mass star. And uh, so this is the luminosity as a function of uh, age in million year. And then, well, the models provide you know, uh, something at t equals zero. What is t equals zero? OK, so models have two approaches. Either we can use arbitrary initial conditions, that is, we totally neglect any kind of history of the star formation process. So what we do is that we start from a very bright and large configuration such that the thermal, stars, the thermal time scale is very short. The thermal time scale, so this is given by uh, gm squared divided by the radius and the luminosity of your object. And this provides a characteristic time scale for a star to contract and to radiate all of its thermal energy. It's also the typical time scale for an object to adjust to any kind of thermal perturbation. So the point is that if you start from such a configuration with very small kelvin Elmer's time scale or thermal time scale, then the model will forget its initial conditions after a few thermal time scale. And I just show here an example, again, with the one solar mass star starting from two different configuration. That is a model that is much brighter then the other model in red, the initial thermal time scale is smaller than one million year. And as you can see, so here, this is the time in 10 to the five years. You can see that typically after one million year, then the tracks converge and therefore initial conditions are forgotten. So that's very convenient, of course, but this provides quite realistic models at ages below one million year. And the problem is that most of the time, if you're looking at young planets or circumstellar disk, then you are usually interested in ages which are about one million year or below one million year. So the other possibility is to account for accretion process. That is to take into account some history of the star formation process. And this has been uh, Quite, uh, there has been quite a lot of activity to try to take into account this accretion history. And those efforts from modelers has been particularly motivated by one very known puzzle in the field, which is the spread in um, the spread of objects in Hirschsprung cell diagram, that is in effective temperature luminosity diagram, or in color magnitude diagram for young cluster members. So we know that if you look at a young cluster, then you have a spread in luminosity 
or ineffective temperature. And if you put, you compare that to isochrones from models, then you can get a large age, age spread. But is this a realistic age spread or could actually this spread in luminosity be due to effect of accretion? And I work on that with my collaborators and there have been also a lot of, uh, of work on that, uh, like I would say um, 15 years ago. And accretion, models have shown that accretion at early stages of evolution can affect the evolution even after a few million years and could partly produce this observed spread in the hash prong cell diagram. But the problem is that you have two major uncertainties when you do this type of, uh, of models with accretion. First of all, you need, of course, the accretion rate. And this will de depend on the star formation model. And this is not an exact science, star formation model. And to understand what's going on here, uh, just to show you, what the model shows is that an object that accretes will contract faster. That is, the structure will be more compressed than a non-accreting counterpart. And such an effect will indeed uh, take place if the accretion time scale is much smaller than the thermal time scale, which means that an object which would accrete, like here, this uh, black curve, by accreting mass, it will have no time to adjust and therefore no time to adjust its radius. And the radius will remain much smaller than the non-accreting counterpart for the same mass and the same age. And this is an effect that uh, for which all modelers agree. But that's a good thing. But then there is another uncertainty with the uncertainty on the accretion rates, which is the amount of internal energy that will be accreted during the accretion process uh, by the accreting object. And this is a fraction of the accretion energy here. And of course, uh, this will depend on the star formation model, but this will also depend on the mass transfer in the accretion disk and also on what we call the boundary layer between the disk and the accreting, the central protostar. This is a tough problem. And in models, usually this alpha is a free parameter and vary between zero and one. But clearly, it's easy to understand that if alpha is different from zero, you bring an extra source of energy to the object. And therefore, it will be less compact than if alpha was equal to zero. And we have shown, for example, that accretion can produce young objects with a range of initial luminosities, depending on the accretion rate and depending on the value of alpha. And here, this is just an, an example for brown dwarf of final mass 0.04 Sulama star, but this is valid for a stellar object as well. So what you can see is the luminosity as a function of time. So the black curve is there is no accretion. If you now take into account accretion, but with alpha equals zero, which is a cold accretion, then the luminosity, the object will be much fainter. <clears throat> Whereas if you account for hot accretion with a given value of alpha, then the object will be actually warmer. So you can see that uh, there is an important effect, not only on the fact that you account for accretion, that is increase of mass as a function of time, but also on this energy which is accreted. So they are increasing efforts to provide a consistent picture that is from the molecular cloud collapse to the formation of crystalline cores, the formation of a disk, and then disk evolution, and then protostar evolution. And here, for example, uh, I will quote the work of uh, Jensen and Altboller based on numerical, simula numerical simulations, following the formation in a molecular cloud, that is the collapse <clears throat> of a molecular cloud, which produce a lot of crystalline cores. And then what they do is that they have zoom on the crystalline core and look at the accretion rates 
which uh, is uh, happening on this pre-stellar core. And if they take wow. that into account for all of those pre-stellar cores which form in this molecular cloud, they can construct a synthetic cluster of young stars. And here you see maps of the population density of those objects, the blue being less dense uh, objects and the, re the red being very dense <clears throat> uh, location. For the, for, the, for the young stars. And what you can see is that actually those synthetic cluster are going to depend on this value of alpha. So even if you can determine somehow from models the accretion rate, unfortunately, you are still depending on this value of alpha. So this is a very challenging and very exciting problem, I would say, but my message here is that unfortunately this means that models at young ages, even if they account for some star formation process, they have still inherent uncertainties that we have to take into account. So now the other point, which is linked actually, is the impact of rotation and magnetic fields on stellar structures. So since 2000, there has been a huge activity to study those effects of rotation and magnetic field on inner structure of fully convective objects like Loma stars and brown dwarfs. And I would say those efforts has been motivated by key observations for eclipsing binaries of Loma stars where a link between the magnetic activity and abnormally large radius has been established by uh, several observers. And here you can see this is the mass radius observations for eclipsing binary. And those are standard models. And you can see that you have objects which are abnormally inflated. And what is even more interesting is that this um, observers have found a similar effect on the radius in single magnetically active late type stars. So the theoretical interpretation is that strong magnetic fields can suppress or reduce the efficiency of interior convection. Or strong magnetic fields can also produce cool surface spots. And both effects, in any case, the net result is to reduce the heat flux and therefore to increase the radius of the object and to decrease the effective temperature. So there are several type of different models, I would say, which take into account those effects. Uh, we have been working on a phenomenological, phenomenological approach where we can mimic the reduction of convection efficiency by magnetic field just by decreasing the mixing length parameter. The mixing length parameter is just a kind of efficiency parameter for your convective transport. And if it decreases, then convection trans convective transport decrease in efficiency. And you can see that if you decrease this value of alpha here, then you can increase the radius of your object and therefore you can fit those eclipsing binaries. Same with spots, uh, there are different types of models which are more or less sophisticated, but basically the idea is that in your models you cover the stellar surface with a, a fraction of, of spots, which can be characterized by a parameter beta. And basically, the, to understand the, the effect of those spots is that if you have an object radiating a given luminosity, and then you cover it uh, with cool spots. So what happens is that for the objects to radiate the same amount of, of, uh, of energy, the same amount, the same luminosity, so the star will have the, will increase its radius, will increase its radiating surface, and therefore the radius will increase and the effective temperature will decrease. So therefore the main impact is actually to increase the radius and to make the objects slightly cooler. And you have here, for example, models of Summers and Pinsano, uh, where you can see by covering, so this is the mass radius relationship, by covering by 
objects on the uh, at the beginning of the main sequence, beginning of hydrogen burning, then you can see that the radius is slightly infl inflating. So the question now is, okay, should we use non-standard models rather than using the type of um, stellar models with arbitrary initial condition? This is a good question. And to answer to it, let's just look at a, a recent uh, analysis of the young Orion trapezium cluster by Fang and collaborators. So this uh, cluster is about a million year old. And what they show is that if you use models with magnetic fields as developed, for example, by the, the Dartmouth group, Gregory Feiden, then you can better explain over luminous or too cool low mass young objects, particularly in this regime here, where it's difficult for standard models to really get here. And if you take into account models with accretion, like the one that we have derived, then you can explain abnormally faint objects. Or those abnormally faint objects could also be explained by high inclination disks. And there here, this is observations will probably decide what is the major effect. But that's interesting because, uh, okay, should we use not standard models? Then I would answer, yes, certainly you can. But you have to be very aware that 1D stellar evolution models rely on phenomenological prescriptions of 3D effects, such as rotation and magnetic field, that still need to be validated. So word of caution, because there are still a lot of uncertainty in this type of models, as I've tried to show you. OK, so now let's go to my last point which is more about atmosphere models. And here I would like to highlight a particular challenge of uh, relevance for this uh, Sagan workshop on exoplanets and, and young planetary objects. There, uh, so I want to highlight an uncertainty regarding the determination of metallicity of a young object versus non equilibrium chemistry. So no panic. What's the point? So basically, the idea is that measurements of non-solar abundance ratio in the atmosphere of a young planetary object could indicate the formation process. That is a formation in a protoplanetary disk versus a stellar lot formation from the collapse of a molecular cloud. And this idea comes from the fact that we know that giant planet atmospheres our own giant planets, such as Jupiter and Saturn, Saturn, are enriched in heavy elements. And the interpretation is that this enrichment, abnormal enrichment in heavy elements, is inherited during the planetesimal accretion as the planet form via typically the core accretion model. And Jupiter, for example, I show, and this is in situ measurement, so uh, this is really quite robust. So, for example, uh, carbon and uh, other type of uh, heavy elements are enriched by more than a factor of two in Jupiter and Saturn from spectroscopic determination, carbon and nitrogen are also significantly enriched. So that's great because then you say, okay, uh, if we can measure the abundance ratio in a planetary mass object, then uh, we'll have very important uh, information. And we could infer whether this is a brown dwarf or whether this is a planet forming a planetary disk through core accretion. But is it really straightforward to measure the metallicity or abundance ratio? Unfortunately not. Uh, and the question is valid uh, because for stars, for example, there has been such improvements in stellar spectroscopy with high resolution spectroscopy, but also in synthetic spectra for stars, which are based now on 3D models, even non-LT models, not local thermal equilibrium models, where it's possible to infer with a high accuracy the metallicity of a star. But for cool objects, that's complicated. And one of the reasons for that is that 
there is a process that we call non-equilibrium chemistry process. So basically, the, the idea is that uh, some chemical reactions can be very slow. And if you have a process of vertical transport, some kind of process of mixing in the atmosphere, for example, via convective motions or via some kind of turbulence, then this can lead to departure from equilibrium. And this was a mechanism suggested to operate in Jupiter already in 97. And now it is a prevalent feature that is observed in many brown dwarfs. So basically, what's this process? So if you look at the carbon chemistry, the main re reaction involving CO and methane is this one. And below typically 2000 Kelvin, methane is going to become the dominant form of carbon. But the problem is that the transformation of CO in methane is much slower than the inverse reaction, which means that if you have some mixing process, such that the mixing time scale is much faster than the time to transform CO in methane, then the abundance of CO is going to be much larger than predictions that are based on local equilibrium, which is the standard assumption in the many atmosphere models that you're using. And uh, the existence of this process has been confirmed by the detection of large, abnormally large abundance of CO in the atmosphere of the cold brown dwarf, Gliese 229D, and uh, the, the reference by those people here. So we have exactly the same process for nitrogen chemistry, where uh, the reaction of nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, in ammonia is much slower, slower than the inverse reaction. The problem is that the vertical mixing in an atmosphere is parameterized by a parameter which is called KZZ. I think some of you have heard about this famous KZZ. And this is just characterizing the uh, what we call the eddy diffusion coefficient. Uh, this is characterizing the time scale or the inverse of the time scale of mixing. And this is very poorly constrained in atmospheres. So typically by, we, have, we vary it by orders of magnitude. So the problem is that non equilibrium chemistry could mimic the signature of non-solar metallicity. How can it be? So I'm going to illustrate this. For example, if you, take a spectra, so this is synthetic spectra from atmosphere models, and you increase the metallicity by a factor of five. This is the red curve here. What is going to happen is that you're going to increase, of course, the absorption of CO, typically at four micron, because you have more CO. But if you look at the effect of non equilibrium chemistry, then non equilibrium chemistry here in red is actually also going to increase the abundance of CO. So you are also going to increase the absorption feature of CO. So you can get actually the same type of signature. And how to disentangle one from the other, I would say this is uh, still on the way. And there are uh, huge efforts from modelers from different groups uh, uh, here who are trying to find the best diagnostic to disentangle non equilibrium chemistry versus the metallicity effects. And this is, of course, crucial in order to have uh, a better, uh, I would say, determination of the fundamental abundance in your young planetary, planetary mass object. So I will stop here. And uh, so what I wanted here to highlight were uh, some uncertainties of stellar model that are relevant for this workshop. And my first message is that the uncertainties of stellar models at very young ages is a reality. And we have to work with it. We have to survive with it. So first of all, effects of accretion. Um, I would say the modelers are working uh, more and more, and there are more and more efforts to try to build a consistent picture between molecular cloud collapse, disk evolution, and early protostar evolution. As I say, this is a challenge, but this is a way to go. 
And regarding non-standard physics, that is the effect of rotation and magnetism, so we really need to have a validation of formalism that I use in 1D stellar evolution code from 3D MHD simulations, magnetohydrodynamic simulations. I think this is really necessary. And there is a sustained effort from the stellar MHD community. I think also what is important is that from observations, we can learn a lot and try to limit the uncertainties from the models. And therefore, it is absolutely key to gather multiple information that is not only the spectra and the magnitude, but we need also now to have information about the activity, magnetic activity, about the rotation, about lithium abundances. I didn't mention that, but this is, uh, I would say, a good diagnostic for inner structure of objects and also the cluster membership. So mothers and observers have to try to work hand in hand in order to improve and, and I would say decrease those uncertainties. And regarding atmosphere signatures of formation process, they, I think it's, uh, uh, so there are huge efforts to try to find the sweet spots in the spectra to distinguish metallicity versus non-equivalent chemistry effects. And this is apply, I would say a systematic analysis of, uh, of, uh, of synthetic spectra and a systematic comparison with observations. And also, uh, it, I think it's very important to try to provide constraints, not from calibration of observations, but from hydrodynamical simulations. And just to finish, I just want to show here the effect of rotation magnetic field and the way to go. So I say the way to go is through um, 3D uh, hydrodynamical simulations or magneto hydrodynamical simulations. And here, I just want to illustrate uh, what people are able to do, for example, for the rotation of fully convective objects. Uh, you can see here, so this is uh, from simulations of, uh, of Matt Browning, one of my colleagues in Exeter. And uh, so it's possible to have the map here of a rotating object. This is the radial velocity at the surface of uh, an M dwarf. And if you increase in the model, the uh, rotation rate significantly increased. What you can see is that there is an organization of the convection and which is responsible for inhibition of the convective transport. And if you add a magnetic field on the top of that, then you see also the impact of the magnetic field on, on the, uh, I would say, the convective patterns. So it's possible, but there is still a long way to go to derive robust formalism for stellar models. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.